Hello everybody, good morning, good afternoon, and good night, depending on where you are. I'm assuming for most of you it'll just be a good day. So today we're going to continue where we left off last video, talking about looping in Python, and we covered the majority of it actually. We covered the while loop a couple of days ago, and then last video we covered the for loop, and we played around using loops with uh, with lists, and so Really today is going to kind of expand upon that. We already technically showed an example of a nested for loop, but I'd like to kind of just look at them a little bit more in detail and understand them better. I also want to introduce break and continue statements, which I mentioned at some point before, but I kind of want to make sure I make sure that you know what those are and when to use them and when not to use them. And then from there, we want to make some interesting data structures. Uh, so far, we're kind of just doing these one-dimensional arrays, and you know we live in a 3D world, so let's make a 3D array. And then finally, if we have time, we do might do a little bit of list comprehension, uh, but uh, we'll see. Okay, so to kind of refresh what we were doing last time with the for loop, we figure out that a for loop is a. We, we also talked about the range function, and, and, and basically. Uh, range-based for loop is one where you're going to run it on a list or some sort of data and you're going to iterate through each item and the for loop is basically the ideal tool for that because if you have a list of data literally here we have a, a list called data and we just want to go through each item one at a time we can just say for i and data and i is going to contain one item at a time and it's going to go from beginning to end and this is a pretty robust way of iterating through the loops. Uh, we also talked about range function and how you're able to use that to basically iterate through a series of numbers, which you can then use to access a data uh, as an index, right? So the range function allows you to pass in one or more arguments. If you just pass in one argument, we said that that is just going to be the numbers that it's going to iterate through. So if I say, for i in range, what's going to happen is i is going to contain the value 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, not including 5. So it's going to iterate through five numbers, but you know, you start counting from 0. And so, you know, if you have a list, you have some, some, some data list that contains some values in it, I should say it contains a bunch of letters. If I go in here and say, something like print and then d sub i here what i'm doing is i'm accessing the index at the i location so the first time this runs uh, it's going to have a zero and so we're going to get the zero element and remember indexing starts at zero in python so that's going to be this one when i is equal to one then you're going to get the y and then you're going to get the x and so on so basically if you think about it that's kind of what we're doing like that and we're never going to see the, the uh oops we're never going to see the 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 c printed because we're only iterating to the first five elements of course if we wanted to fix that we could just change this to say six and now we'd be good because as you can see we would cover from zero to five so that's the range function with one parameter with two parameters it's a start and a stop so if we say something like 0 through 6, that's going to basically do the same thing uh, because it's not going to be inclusive of that last value. Uh, and we can, we can test that very quickly by just writing the for loop and saying for i in range 0 to 10. And for now, just print the contents of i. And if we run it, be a little patient. Uh, here we go. Uh, there we go. I had to scroll to the bottom. You can see it goes from zero all the way to nine. Uh, yeah, as you can see there. Okay, so that's not including the ten. And of course, the other example. If I just put in a five, you can see it's going to go from zero to four and end. Okay. So that's with two parameters. And finally, with the third parameter, we said that that's the step. So if normally, by default, this is like a one, because it goes, you know, one, two, three, four, five. But if we wanted to go in steps of 
more than one, so say like two, then it's gonna go, you know, zero, two, four, and well, it, it will not print six because that's the last value. So really this would just print out zero, two, and four. We wanna see that in action, we can do that. Just put zero, six, and then put step of two. And of course, you know, remember, if you're using something like an IDE, like, like uh, Python's, uh, uh, what's it? Uh, PyCharm and, 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 and IntelliBrain and JetBrains, or if you're using VS Code, Microsoft VS Code, or any other Spider or, or Jupyter Notebook or any of those tools, they, they can help you uh, have some sort of autocomplete to kind of give you a hint as to what functions do, and that's very useful because not everybody remembers these things by heart. In fact, the majority of people will not remember these functions by heart unless they are actively using them every day. And there's just so many of them that, you know, the first few times you do it for a project, you might need to refresh it. After that, you pick it up and you're super strong with it. But the next project is something else. So you switch to that and then you got to switch back to the original one and you're rusty. So, you know, you're not expected to memorize all these functions. Uh, like, well, range is really trivial and you do use it a lot. But, you know, when you get to libraries, you kind of have to use the documentation to augment your brain unless you have like super awesome memory, which, uh, if you do, then that's awesome, but uh, the majority of us don't, so consider yourself lucky if you're in that category, I guess. Uh, although, yeah, I'm actually, I got pretty good, I, well, I used to have really good photographic memory. Uh, I could uh, remember every single uh, shot from a movie, and I could identify it, and also dialogue, like, it was incredible. But uh, I started to lose that a couple of years ago, so very sad. Uh, but I can still, you know, I'm still pretty good at, I've seen the movie and you show me a picture, I can usually recognize it still. But it's definitely not the same as it was before. Um, anyways, so, you know, if you're, if you're like everybody else, you don't have to uh, memorize these things. You have, just use the documentation for your advantage and save your memorization for something more important. Okay, so that's the range function. We also said that we doesn't necessarily have to go up in, in, in increase increments. You know, you can also make a negative step. But then if you're counting down, you know, don't do what we did, which is uh, leave this the same. You have to flip them, right? So because this is always the start and this is the stop and this is your increment. So if you would like to count down, then make sure your start is bigger than your stop. Otherwise, it'll stop immediately. So, yeah, we had that issue. Okay. So that's pretty much what we did last time. And so now, like I said, I, I would like to, uh, to expand upon the usage of loops by kind of making a, let's start by making a two-dimensional array, okay? So what's a two-dimensional array? Just to make sure we're on the same page here. You know, when you think of single dimension, you usually think of a line, you know? A, and so a line has distance associated to this. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And so, you know, if you have a line of length two, then you have basically this, right? And that's just a line. That's one dimension. And that's basically how you have your data on the list, right? You have indices. Two dimensions, it's going to be a rectangle, right? Because now you still have the first dimension included when you have a two-dimensional, you know, object per se. So you still have that indexing, but you also have now the second dimension that you can go towards. So, you know, if you think of a rectangle, this could be length and width or length and depth, if you think about it that way. But ultimately, the most easy thing to understand for this is think about rows and columns, right? So we have the columns up here and the rows. And so now, whereas before we could just store one piece of data here, like for example, this is one data point, one data point, one data point, one data point, one data point. Now, you know, we can still do that here. You know, we can store uh, data points here, here, uh, technically, I guess we start indexing from zero, so let's just be consistent with that. So we can still have our data points like that, uh, although I guess this should be right at the, you know, right there, for the zero, zero. But now you can also have on like row three, four, five, you can also have data points, right? So these data points can coexist within the same dimension one because the dimension two is what separates them. So that's a rectangle. 3D, and, then, and this is usually 2D is what we do with tables, rows and columns. 3D is where things get more interesting. 3D is going to be a cube. So when you're thinking of a cube, you got all the same stuff that you get with uh, with the 2D object. So you get your rows and columns, 
but now you also have this death, right? So it, like you can think of it as stacking a bunch of tables on top of each other as long as they have the same number of rows and columns. Uh, otherwise, that has a name too called Rag Array, but I'm not going to talk about that. So ultimately, the easiest way for us to visualize data in a 3D environment is to just have a bunch of 2D tables stacked on top of each other. If you have three of them, then that's your death right there. Okay? So think of it like this. So if you have a little table that contains 15 elements in it here, you know, and we would like to bring it to the 3D world, let's just put a bunch of these like that. Let's just say we got three of them. And so there you go. That's already stored there, okay? And of course, you stack it like that, and bam, you got yourself a five by three, and then in this case, by three, okay? So there's your cube. Uh, you can go higher dimension, so you can go into like a 4D, and of course, you know, uh, when we think of like the real world, we can't really picture that, so we think of that as time, right? Why? Because in the same location of this cube, where you have this cube right now, in this second, you can store some data, but the next second, you can also store the same cube of data, but for that instance. So it could be completely different data actually with the same dimensions, right? So you can sort of think about this depth as well, but now this is gonna be the four dimension the time, right? So this could be one second in, two seconds in, three seconds in. So like, think about like when you're looking at data, data analytics and whatnot, you have a bunch of tables for a specific time period. Like let's say exactly at 4 p.m., you have uh, three tables, each of them dealing with different information. So then you go ahead and at one hour later at five, you reread all that information and you have brand new data. Let's say it's weather data, so it changes, okay? And then you do it at six. So ultimately when you're trying to store that, you just store a bunch of different uh, three sort of 3D tables with time, or you just make a 4D table that can store everything, right? So that you can just keep everything in one nice data structure and the reason why you want to do that instead of keeping them separately is because then you can use loops to iterate very easily, okay? So don't think that like going to a higher dimension is super abstract and you're never going to use it. No, you can actually use it and code it that way. Uh, although higher than 4D, you know, I, I, I guess there has to be a reason for doing that. So, yeah, we'll see. But uh, if you are curious what the shape is called for, for a, a for, uh, for a 4D or higher, that becomes a cube and there's a cube inside of it. And this is known as a hypercube. So that's what it would look like, okay? So, yeah, but you know, again, it's easier for us to see this, just like even for 3D, it's easier to see this than seeing a cube when it comes to data, okay? So, yeah, in fact, just to make sure we're 100% getting what I'm saying, this is a cube, right? So what I'm saying is if I'm making a 4D, then I got a bunch of these. So now my dimensions are a five by three by three by four. And that is coming from five by three by three. And then by four as in like you know, one, two, three, four. I can't really draw, I guess I can tell you like a line like that. There we go, we have four, okay? So that's where those dimensions are coming from, just to make sure we're on the same page, okay? So what I wanna show you is how you can actually make this in Python, so. When we get to NumPy and Pandas, we're gonna revisit an easier way of doing this, but for now, we're just gonna do the basic list, okay? So first, let's just, Let's go ahead and just store a bunch of zeros, okay? We can fill it in with other data for now, but for now we're just gonna put a bunch of zeros. If you're doing something like in C++ or something, you can actually define the size of an array uh, and call it a day. But in Python, since you're just sort of throwing things in, we kind of have to fill it with something. So we'll fill it in with zeros for now or with random numbers or something, okay? So we know how to make a 1D list. I'm just gonna call it, a, well, I can't start with, D, we'll say D1 for dimension one, okay? Bam, I just made a 1D list, you know, and I can append things to it. 
by saying like, you know, append a, a number of zero, like I said, and I can do a bunch of these. That's one way to do it. I could also, of course, throw in zeros like this, or I can do a mixture of these, although, you know, why would you do that? And then you can have eight of them. So if I wanna see what is currently contained in there, I can go ahead and say print d1, and then we can see we have two, four, six, and eight, like because we have both methods. But now let's just stick to the first one, okay? So this works for 1D list, but for 2D list, uh, there it gets a little trick here. So because when we look at the way we're storing a 2D list, is it has a uh, rows and columns length and width. I want you to kind of think about this sort of splitting method that we did for 3D and apply it to the 2D, okay? So the 2D can be actually split into a bunch of 1D lines, right? So the same method how I took the 3D and split it by just showing these three, like that, I can take that same approach to split the 2D actually. We don't really think about that one in a split way because we we're just so used to seeing tables. Uh, but really, you know, if I put a bunch of these like that, how many did I have? Three. Then this is the same thing as the table here. Right? That's the same thing. So we just don't really think about it that way, but we can declare it this way. So all we really need are three lists of the same size. Okay? So let's actually go with the dimensions that we listed here. So let's go with the uh, five by three dimension. And let me show you how you would do that. So because all we are going to have in this sort of master list is three smaller lists, we can actually do that. Uh, one of the ways that we can visualize this is by doing this. Let's put some spaces so it's easier to read for now. Put a comma there. And let's kind of just think about what is happening here, okay? Oh, okay, let's get rid of the, actually, let's leave the appends for now. But Let's just comment them out. Let's see what this is doing and, and what it's printing out. So you can see it's printing out basically the same thing, but let's understand what this is. We have a list. And in this list, you know, before we were just storing numbers. But here, we're not storing numbers. We're storing these little square brackets. And we know that when we declare a list, all we do is say something like square brackets, right? And that's just an empty list. So the two square brackets together signify empty list. That's what they mean to Python. And so when I go in and put little square brackets inside what's already a list, I am putting a list inside of another list. So this is like list inception, okay? I'm putting a list inside another list. In this case, I'm actually putting three lists inside another list. Now, why three? Because that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm saying, okay, I have list one, two, and three here. So list one, two, and three. And I'm actually gonna store this, if you think about this horizontal line here, as its own kind of list. And that's kind of, each little dot here is essentially a reference to these lists. Okay? So this itself is a one-dimensional list, and then these are sort of one-dimensional lists as well. But this one-dimensional list is just containing a reference to the inner list. It's not really containing anything itself. That's the best way to, visual, to visually think about this, okay? So here, we have a list containing three sublists. Now, everything is empty. And these sublists, I can actually go in and throw data here. Uh, let's, yeah, let's, put, let's, let's put a count. It'll be easier to actually see it when we print it. So here we have two, four, five numbers. And then here we can have, you know, a couple of other set of numbers. Uh, let's leave that one empty for now. Or actually, let's, leave, let's put in uh, one number in there, okay? So if we run it, I'm going to get the same thing as you see there. But what is happening internally is that I am storing numbers inside of this list. So this list would be the equivalent of putting here, you know, the, uh, the one, two, three, four, five. And then here I put the six, seven, eight, nine. Did I only put four numbers in that one? Oh no, 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 I started at zero, that's why. And I put that one here, technically. And then here there's just a 10, okay? So obviously this list is smaller, so it would actually look more like uh, 
more like that but uh yeah we'll, we'll make it we'll make them all even in a minute so we'll we'll store 10 11 12 13 and 14. okay so yeah i'm trying to make you know if you're familiar with list this might be very boring for you uh, but i'm trying to make it as uh, straightforward as possible for someone that's never seen this before okay so please be patient if you have experience with this uh, this is after all kind of beginners python so yeah okay so we have a list inside of a list and we can do the same exact concept so here we'll call this d2 since this is not two dimensions and we will leave the one as we originally had it which uh, we can just throw in like a bunch of numbers like that okay now similarly to the append method you can use append uh, to build to build this list so let's just make another 2d we'll call this one 2d out or 2d alternate just an alternate name and we're going to make again a single list but this time we can actually call the append and then when we append we can throw in the list now if we just throw in an empty list you know we do this five times since we want five of them oh hold on i gotta i gotta uh do a couple of things first of all i forgot the period so here let's just let's see. it'll be easier than editing it and then here let's print the mode out as well there is a shortcut to edit all at once i, I don't remember it but yeah so here you go as you can see the append method will do the same thing to insert the list as well um here oh i guess we have three lists now so well, we don't need to see this d1 anymore so so like that so you can see all the data is contained as we expect but you can also see that we can we can append the list this way as well so we don't have to build it on on, on the beginning like this we can actually append the brand new list as we go and these could contain data themselves so i could go in here and do this And append that way and as you can see now I have five of them so that'll work uh, additionally another thing that I can do is I can append an empty list and then go ahead go back and modify it so let's talk about that so right now what I'm doing is I am appending the empty lists here I do have one with some data but let's append a couple of empty ones so as you can see you know you gotta keep track of your bracketing so this bracket closes with this bracket and then this bracket closes with this bracket so that's because we line four here inserted that and then these are empty so suppose that i have this list right here what if i wanted to insert some numbers here okay i can do that or mod not just insert but like maybe remove or something okay or what if i want to add an extra number to this inner list so let's talk about how you access the indexing in a multi-dimension so with one dimension we understand that we can use the identifier name and then we can use the square brackets and then list a numerical expression in here that can essentially give you the index that you want right so if i say d23 that's going to access not the third element but the fourth element right because remember that the, the count starts from zero so that's technically the fourth element of the list right so that works for a one dimension access. When you're trying to do multi-dimension, it's actually pretty nice. If you're, if you're actually working with lists like I'm doing right now, all you have to do is, so let's say that you have you know, a little square here and you're trying to access this element right there, okay? So we can write our indexing as zero, one, and two. So we can see that it, this is on row zero, column one per se and so if we want to access that this way uh, then all we have to do is say let's say d is the name of this list we can say we want that row and then we want to say we want that column and bam you're good to go so that's really nice if this was a 3d array all you have to do is put another set of square brackets and put the dimension there there's one there's one catch to this that you gotta make sure you don't screw up this dimension right now I'm associating with this and this dimension here I'm associating with this obviously if you flip them 
like that, then you're looking now at a completely different number. You're looking at this number, right? So you gotta you gotta decide how your what your row and column is uh, when it when you're actually declaring the code. The first dimension that you make is going to be the leftmost one. So and then the second dimension is going to be that one. Okay. So in my code here. This is the outer dimension. So this indexing is, you could think of this as like index zero, index one, and index two. And then this is the second dimension is what's inside. And you can see that, you know, if you don't, if you don't remember by saying something like, let's just access, let's go ahead and access this three right here. Or actually, let's just get this list back first. So if you want to get that list back first, we say print D2, and then we put the index of that list. So that's the first list, so it's index zero. So if I go ahead and do that, and I'm going to comment out these other ones just so we don't get overwhelmed with numbers, we can see that we get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, which is this list. If I change this to, say, index 2, that's going to be the third set of lists here. So that's list 1, list 2, list 3, and as you can see, that matches what we get here. Okay? So this indexing is to access the sublists here. Now, if within that, I want to access a specific member of the sublist, so like, for example, the 12, uh, or let's access the 10 first, then all you have to do is put the index of that. So if I do that, I'm going to get back the 10. Notice that I don't get any square brackets back. Just to make sure we're on the same page, whenever you say print and you print a list, and it's actually a list data structure, it is going to throw in the square brackets to tell you that it's a list. And of course, if it's you know a list inside a list, we saw that it prints out multiple square brackets, right? Because it helps us understand the dimensionality of the data. When you just get a raw number like this, it means that you're actually accessing an individual element. So it's kind of important to understand that because, you know, that is not the same as if like, let's just say that we had, you know, in here, like a letter A, and then we also have a list that contains a letter B in it. Okay, so doing this, if I want to access the letter A, that is going to be index 0, 1, 2, 3. So if I do that, I'm going to get the A. However, if I want to get the B, I could do index 4 and I would print it and I would see a B. However, you see that you get the square brackets around it because what you're getting is actually not a list. I'm sorry, it's not a string. It's actually a list. It's just a list with one element, so it looks like this. So you got to make sure you recognize the difference because if you're processing this, you know, this is it's a string. So like here, let me let me give you an example. So let's say that I have a string here. Uh, let's call this str1 that contains the word uh, uh, book. Okay. But maybe just book, and you want to put the b for book there. Okay. And so you might be compelled to say, well, I would like to say print, and then say I want str1 to be printed. And then before that, I would like to print out the B from the book. So that's, you know, this indexing, D24. So you do that and you print it out, you're going to get, you know, the syntax, which is not what you're looking for. Or worse yet, you're like, oh, well, that's a B. So maybe let's try to concatenate it. You do that and then bam, you get an error because it says you can only, concat can only concatenate list to another list, which is true. You can actually connect the list together with concatenation. That's not really what we're trying to do here. We're trying to concatenate two strings, right? So what you're really trying to do is access that individual element. So even though this is one a single item list, which means it really shouldn't be a list, but you know, for, for formatting purposes, you have it as a list, or just when you're processing your messy data, it's a list. Uh, not yours, but like whoever's data it is. I'm not saying your, your guys' data is messy. It's just usually data is not in the best of ideal ways because people can't read your minds of what you want, right? So it's expected. But yeah, so because this is a sublist, what I really should be doing here, and I've run into this a lot of times, is accessing index zero of that. That will get me back to B. Uh, ignore the error right now. Let me just comment out the error so you can see it. I mean, you can already see it at the bottom there, but I, I'm not a fan of running code and then an error popping up. So you can see now that we're actually getting the B instead of getting the square bracket. So. Let's bring that back so we can see this, the square bracket. But in this version here, when we concatenate, let's actually access the individual B by putting index zero. And as you can see now, 
we're getting what we were looking for, which is to actually get the string component and then cap it. <coughs> so yeah, the most common time that I run into this sort of weird situation where like we have like a single element list and you have to do this at, you know, the square bracket zero is uh, when you're doing a query. So you're running Python, but if you're doing a SQL query and if you don't know what SQL is, don't worry, can you take the, the DA651, I believe it is? Uh, that one covers SQL. But yeah, when you're when you're doing a SQL query, you connect to a database and you get a table back usually. Even, and, and like, you get a table even if you only request like a single element. It'll just be a table with just one element. So Python will usually interpret that as a list with one element. And you might even see it like double layer. So you might see something like this back. So let's just say our query is, is coming back and it's literally coming like this. Okay. So, you know, when you try to print it to see what you got back, you know, you get to see something like this. And if you're just trying to actually extract the, uh, the word book from there, which is the actual results of the query, you end up basically having to, uh, to, to access things with weird indexing. So, you know, index zero, and then index zero of that. And now we actually get the word book instead of a list that contains the word book. And you can confirm that, of course, because you can use the, the you can print the type of something by writing type. And so if you say type Q, and you run that, it tells you it's a list. And if you say the type of Q zero, which is the inner list, it'll still tell you that it's a list, right? But if I go and access the first element of that inner list, which is actually the word book, now it's a string so now that's what i want and of course don't forget you also have the other function known as instance of that i showed the other day or is instance stuff my bad there is the case i don't i don't remember the exact name of the function but thanks to the autocomplete it helped me out so yeah so you can use you know if you're unsure whether that's a string you can say something like uh, i think it's list like that yeah uh nope what is it it maybe it might be LST. Oh, wait, no, 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 I need to put a comma there. Yeah, there we go. I should have read the documentation, but it's kind of hard to talk and read at the same time, but yeah. So here you can see that this returns true because you can check that. So you can put this in this statement and say, if this instance is a list, then maybe I need to access the first element, right? So yeah, a lot of useful cases for this, but it also brings up a good point. So let us say that, uh, you know, we do some sort of query and instead of getting back like this, you know, this, this double list inside of each other, we just get like an empty one, okay? Could happen. Like when you do a query to find all the people whose name starts with DE uh, and then you get none back. So, you know, you, you, you if you if you try to print it like as it is, as it is now, but this what is this one called? It's, uh, we'll call this Q2. You know this will say it's a list. Well, if you print it like that, you'll see that it's empty. But uh, you might automatically want to print it out using this method, right? Uh, or not? Sorry, not that method, but uh, without the word type in there. You know you might want to print out like. The contents like the word book right so you would you would print out book as you see here book but if you want to print out now the other one the one that's empty you know you might have the same code like your code is running as part of a script you're doing a bunch of queries some of them are getting the word book back and other words but then you get to one that's empty you run it and bam, you hit an error right here. Let's look at what this error says. This error says exception has occurred, index error, list index out of range. That error is actually really, really clear as to what is happening. The list, so the list, the error is on the list, and it tells you what line it is. It says line 19, which has this line of code, which as you can see, this is the list we're working with. It says this list index out of range. So the index is the number inside of the square bracket. That's, you know, index one, index zero, one, two, three, four, five. And the fact that it says it's out of range means that I want you to think of the range function, right? The range function says like go from this number to this number, right? So when you're thinking of range for a list, that means 
the indexing of the list that is actually valid for that. So if you have five numbers in there, the range is going from zero to four, right? And so ultimately, if you have a list with five items that has zero to four, and you're trying to access like the 10th item, it doesn't exist in the list, right? So Python isn't nice enough to say, oh, well, that doesn't exist. It just gets an error and you crash unless you handle the exception. So this is something that happens in all programming languages. You should not be trying to access something that is out of bounds. It's another name for this. And so one way to check it is there's a function in Python that returns to you the length of a list, which is how many elements are in the list. So that you can use that. If you're using a range-based for loop, that's going to iterate through all the elements and you're never going to run into this kind of issue. Uh, but you just have to be prepared for it. Okay. So how can we deal with it in this case? Well, we can check, we can use the length function. So I would use this in an if statement, but now I'm just going to print it so you can see it. So I could go ahead and print out the length of, bo of both Q and Q1. So you can see the difference in that. Q2 or Q1. Uh, oh, let me, let me comment out the error. Otherwise, we'll never get there. So you can see length of Q has 1 and length of Q2 has 1. Okay, that doesn't really help us, but let's understand as to why that happened. Well, technically speaking, remember, the outer list, which is the outer brackets, for both of these contain one list each. The first one contains a list that, yes, does contain the word book. The second one technically also contains a list. It's just an empty list, but it contains it. So the index of that is one for both. Of course, if, if there was just flat out nothing in here, so if it was just one square brackets, then you would see that this is zero. So you could put an if statement saying, if the length of this is equal to zero, then stop. Do not try to access it in here. But that's not the case here. So then what do we want to check then? Well, let's, okay. You know, obviously you would do this inside another if statement. So in fact, you know, let's go ahead and code that if statement real fast. So why don't we, let us comment that line out. We don't really need it anymore. Let's put it like this. Why don't we say something like, if the length of Q is greater than uh, zero and length of Q2 is greater than zero, so that way we're guaranteeing that we'll never run this piece of code uh, when when uh, when the length is equal to zero, which is what would happen if we didn't have those brackets. Then we can go ahead and try to print out the length of the second dimension, because it means that there's something for us to go into. If we do that, uh, oh, sorry, I put that parenthesis there, I don't mean to put it in there. So if we do that, we can see that this is giving us a one because it's saying that this inner list, so this inner list here contains one element. However, this inner list here contains no elements. So now we see the difference. Now we see that this one is actually empty. But of course, before that, we did the check of the outer list. Why? Because let's go ahead in here and say we just get one list here. You know, in this case, the program does not crash anymore, but it was crashing before because this if statement will check it and then we'll see that length Q is equal to zero. And of course, at that point, it will stop, right? If you wanna see that real fast, let's go ahead and just put that outside like that. So you can see that the length is equal to zero, okay? So, you know, that's how you would check that. So let's go ahead and actually convert that into another if statement. So let's say if length, of q sub zero is greater than zero, then go ahead and print that out. The actual contents of it. And similarly, let's do that for the second one. The reason why I'm putting them in separate if statements this time is because, you know, I, I should really do that for all layers, but it'll take too long. But it's because, you know, I, I, I want I, I have checked to make sure that it's safe, but I know for one of them it's not going to be safe, so that's why I'm putting it as a separate. Okay, uh, sorry, talking at the same time as coding is not helping me out. So this should be Q1 or Q2, 0, greater than 0. And then we can print out Q2, 0, 0. There we go. Okay.
All right, that looks better, nicer. I just want to line that up so it looks pretty. Okay, so now when we run it, it runs, prints out the word book, as you can see there. Um, that's, uh, wait, is it printing it out actually? Oh no, because I removed that because I have it aside for here. Let me put that if I can. So now, we, yeah, there we go. Print out the word book there from here, but it's not printing it here. It's here. So you can see that it prints something else. This is empty, okay? So that's how you can deal with indexing issues. You can check ahead of time to make sure that the index that you're looking for is valid. Let's say you're trying to access index three. Then switch this from uh, zero to four because if index three is valid, it means that there's something on zero, one, two, and three, which would be the means there's four items. So the, the list has to at least have four. So I guess, well, you could put greater than three because four is greater than three. So you could say either greater than three or greater than or equal to four, okay? So that's something to always keep in mind when accessing list that you want to make sure that you're not going out of bounds or out of range because otherwise you get an exception. We will learn how to handle exceptions so that if you ever get one, you don't just terminate the program, but we're not there yet. And really you shouldn't be relying on exceptions to, uh, to, do, the, to do like error checking. You know, you should do those on your own and really not have exceptions for that. That's not the best way to code. Um, but then again, I do actually use exceptions when it comes to SQL for this kind of thing. So, yeah, always exceptions to the rule. Okay. So going back to the way, you know, we, we made a two dimension one, but let's go all the way and make it a three dimension one. Uh, however, let's go ahead and do that in the new, in the new file because this is getting pretty, uh, pretty big here. So let's just, uh, yeah, let's just start clean. So I'll just call it D. This one's going to be the three dimensional one. So one way we can do it is we can do, let's do it with the pens first. Okay. And then the other way, no, let's just, Let's do it in here by hand, and then we'll do, do another version with the pens. So we'll call this one D1. So here we have, we're gonna make it uh, with five. Okay, so here we have this 2D list for so far that has five elements in it. And inside of each of these, I am going to make a list. It gets kind of tricky here. So you can see there's a lot of square brackets, a lot of room for mistake with those square brackets. But uh, I'll space it out so it's a little bit easier to read. So here we have that layer. And then if we have a layer in here of those, I have an idea to make it easier to read. Here, let's just copy paste that actually. So we have one, two, three, four. Yeah, that's big enough. Yep, there we go. Okay, so as you can see, this compiles even though I uh, have a bunch of spacing on my own. That's because whenever you're using the square brackets for the list or the parentheses, Python will ignore the white space and let you organize it how you will. And it's a lifesaver for when you're dealing with these massive things like this, just to make it easier on the eyes. So you could already there insert a bunch of data and so on, right? But as I have it right now, you can see that this right here is just one of the dimensions. And then each of these rows is, 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 a, is a second dimension right there. And then the inner brackets that are empty are the third dimension, okay? So if I pop this up here, let me just draw that really fast. Uh, 
And in case you have noticed, I, you do use a comma to separate each of these lists always. You don't use space for that. So how many do we have? Five? Okay, we need more space then. Bring that down and then let's just shrink this a little bit as a whole. There we go. So for now, let me just move this one up to make it easier to see. So I want you to think of this as like each row is your line with three dots and then these are your inner brackets. So if we color code this, these are these. And then these, technically the whole thing, is this one. And so we basically have how many of those? Five of those. So we're going to shrink them so they fit. Okay, let's keep that one smaller. space there should have made it smaller <laughs> than five but that's okay so that's the five of them we have so like I said you know color code them all I'm, I'm not gonna color code them all in fact here what I can do is just copy and paste that so, so that it's nicely color coded for you four and five and then finally, the outer, the outer ones, so these ones, separated with the commas there, as you can see, would be the equivalent of having that. And the, these are references to these and you don't really need to know this but I'll tell it to you anyways from an implementation perspective like from a programming perspective what's happening in memory is they're actually holding an index uh, pointer to the beginning address of the internal ones so they're technically pointing to the beginning of these inner list like right there okay but again don't worry too much about how that actually is implemented you don't need to know okay so yeah that's that's basically it so that means that if i want to insert something into the uh you know into right here then i will go ahead and put that right here and so on okay so if you want to see this as a cube just to you know, make sure we're really getting all of this then the cube would look like that Like that, okay, and of course it would have all the little squares inside, which it depends. That that's going to depend on the uh, the inner one for the for that data, okay? So yeah, I like that picture actually. That's pretty cool. Okay, so just so you can see it big really fast. I should have just gone big, but here you go. So we have the square brackets there. We have. The different connections there and finally the cube okay so if we would like to access it again like I said all you have to do is say something like d d1 uh, let's say 2 3 
and then well there's two things you can do here let's say you want to edit an element directly then you could put it the you can access it like this but let's see what this is doing so the two here is saying on this first initial list access the third in the, in the third index so this is zero one and two so it's going to access the, these sets and from here this three is would try to access within the squares here so this is one zero one two so we don't actually have a three so here let's switch this to a one for now so again this would be zero one two and from here it's going to be zero one so it's looking right at this one and then in there it would have to access something at spot zero well, we don't really have anything there uh right now if we did you know if it was like five four here and that would be the five but let's say we want to insert something there well we can just do a pen right there and then do a pen to five and then you know i can print it out here by say print d1 but you know it's not really i mean it'll it is, it's for like a quick and dirty be able to see whether something is working or not but this is not very visually appealing compared to like that but you can see it kind of works because i mean you can't this is the outer ones okay and then this inner one is going to match with this one so you can see that's one list so that's index zero index uh, one index two so that's the one we care about and then from there index one is zero one so that's this one and then in, and then we appended there the five and we can see that if we print out the one zero uh sorry not zero or uh, two one zero that's going to print us our five back as seen there so it's not very nice so now comes the time to actually do this at four loops, the title of the day, right? 52 minutes into the lecture. But that's okay, because this list stuff is more important. So how do we print out a list in a relatively nice way? So for now, let me just go ahead and uh, uh, well, let's leave it like that actually for now. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll fill it in later. Okay, so if you want to iterate through this list, one of the ways that you can do it is you could say something like for i in d1, and let's see what this prints out, okay? So if I run it like this, you'll see already there it looks much nicer because what it's doing is it's looking at the outermost brackets, which is basically this one and this one, and for each of those entries, meaning each of those highlighted ones or if we're looking at the color coding stuff it's for each of the yellow ones it's going to print one out of one one per line so already there just that simple change you know makes this look much nicer because it's the square brackets right uh but it looks nice now because it's relatively empty but if it was full of stuff you know it might not be very ideal to see the data uh so what we can do is you know, we can also add a couple of line feeds of our own. So, you know, if you want to add a line feed in Python, you can just put a backslash n. If I do it like that, of course, it's going to split it out a lot, which is not pretty much what I want. But uh, that's because it's 3D data. But if it was 4D data, you know, I may want to split it, right? Because I may want to actually go in and do something like something like this, right? I would like to, to print it out. Well, this is the 4D one, sorry. This is the 3D one. So I may actually want to print out these, these, you know, the squares by each of them. So if that's the case, then we can use some for loops for that. So let's say that here we say, okay, we know that this for loop is going to print out each of these columns, but within that, let's print out each of the rows. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this value, which is representing a list or a row here, like that. And I'm going to iterate through each of the elements in that. So I'm going to iterate through each of the inner square brackets, okay? And the way I'm going to do that is I'm just going to say for j and i. And now, instead of printing i, let's print out j. Let's tab that correctly, and let's see what it looks like now. So now you can see we flattened the list. So now it's printing out a bunch of flat things. So this looks 
It looks okay, but I, I kind of like the previous method better. So what if you still want to do that? Well, the problem is that the print J function is adding a line feed after each one. So what we need to do is we need to modify the, the print function to change whether it adds a line feed or not. And I will leave in the uh, comments below, if I can find it again, the documentation. I'll, I'll post it on the video later. But uh, where is the documentation? Oh, well. Python print function. Let's try geeks for geeks. Here we go. So I will post a link in the description below so you can see it. But uh, you can also see the autofill here. But essentially with print, you know, you, you, you can pass as many parameters as you want and it's going to print a bunch of stuff. But another thing you can do is you can pass a specific parameter called uh, end and then an equal sign. And then inside of that, put in quotes what you want to put between each item. So if I put a space instead of what, well, if I put a line feed, you'll see that nothing happens. It'll be the, it looked the same. The output looks identical because that's the default. But if I put a space, what I'm saying is after each print statement, no longer, please, no longer put a line feed, just put spaces. So as you can see now, I've made a bunch of spaces between them. Okay? So you have more control over what you want to do. Or you can just say put nothing. So then the print is just going to smash everything together, as you can see here. Okay, that's cool. I still want to have one line feed between each of the layers. So I could bring that here and just do a print. Uh, oh, I can do print with line feed there without the separator. And so now it's starting to look a little bit nicer. You know, we have the lists here, but right now we don't really have anything in our list. So let's go ahead and fill our list with random data. Okay, so how do we iterate through it? Well, we can use the same thing we're doing there. We can say for i and di, although this actually in this case, let's use the range function because here's something kind of important. When you're using the, the for i in something, you know, actually here, let's just, let me give you an example. So here, let's just do a little test. Hold temp, it's gonna be an empty list. Um, Actually, here, let's, let's put in some numbers, one, two, and three, or, or zero, 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 actually. No, 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 we'll do one, 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 one. And then let's do a for i and temp. And you might be like, wait, I wanna change all those ones to zero. So, you know, you might say something like i equal to zero and, and basically run this. So then the first time, you know, here, so you can prove that this is kind of doing what you think it's gonna be doing. I'm just gonna go ahead and say print, okay? So if I just run that, I'm gonna get a bunch of ones uh, right here. So I get four ones, and uh, that's, you know, if I print out my list afterwards, it should it should just have the uh, the ones, right? For now, let's quickly comment this out. Okay. So as we can see, we have a bunch of ones. So you might be like, oh, okay, well, you know, this is iterating to each one. So what if I go ahead and just say zero? Is that going to update the list so that each element contains a zero? So when you run it, you see that the list still contains ones. And you're like, why? Like, what is happening here? You know, this is going through each of these. So why can't I update them? And you could even print that like, you know, print what I contains in it. And you'll see that I is zero. But and like you can put the print before and after even. Like you can see before and after. So you see like before one, after zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. So you're like, okay, the i is being updated, but if for some reason it's not actually updating the list. So, you know, for those of you that are new to Python, you you know, you run into the situation, you're gonna start pulling your hair out. You're like, oh, you know, I've been hacked by solar flares or something. Well, I mentioned this at some point, I'm pretty sure, but I would like to really emphasize it right now. When you're using this range based for loop like this, this i value is getting, yes, one of each of these items one at a time, but it's not a reference per se. It's a copy. So it's getting a copy of the value. So what you're changing here is the copy, not the original. So 
it's like if somebody says okay you I'm gonna give you ten numbers for you to do some stuff rather than giving you and letting you borrow the number while you're using it it's like it makes a copy so you can use it and so that's very important because if you're trying to actually update the items in the list this won't work so what do you do well what I was gonna do before I decided to show you this example which is using your range base formula. So what I can do to fix this issue is I can say for I in range, and then in here you can say something like the length of temp, and that will always work in all scenarios because what this is going to be, remember, what, what does range do is what, with a single parameter, so if I say range of four, you know, I guess this is one way of fixing it, but the problem with this method is that it's only gonna work in this specific scenario. I mean, if temp ever changes in size, then uh, it's not really gonna help, right? So, but here, for now, let's just leave it like that and let's see if this is going to work. So, however, it's important to understand that now what range is returning is an index. So now what we need to do is not say, well, we can still print out the index, but you can see that it just prints out one, two, zero, one, two, three, four. What we want to do is we want to say temp and then pass that index, right? Because we know that's how we access index. So we can, if we want to print out what the index contains before and after, you know, we can do that. But for now, you know, we won't print it after, we'll just print it at the end because you'll see that this will work. And then if you want to update it, then you can update it by, let's say we update it to zero, like I said, and then run it like that. You can see that now, you know, when we printed it, before we updated it, it had ones and afterwards it had zeros. Because now we're not playing around with the I. The I is just the index, it's a copy, it's disposable. It's just an index we're using to access an element in the list. But when we're actually using the index square brackets here, we're actually modifying the real list, the only copy of it. Which of course, yeah, if that's not what you intend to do, then be aware of that. So yes, for I and temp is nice and fun right, to quickly access members, but if you're trying to modify them, it's not gonna work. For that, you would need to actually use the, the brackets, okay? However, like I said, this is not ideal because we're hard coding the number here. So what we want to do is we want to make this be flexible in case the temp list is different in size. So we can use the length function for that. We know that if we call print here and we say the length of something like length of this list, that's going to return to us the length, as you can see here by this four. So all I really need to do to get this working is just put that instead of the four there. So just put length temp like that. And that's just going to get a four. But if I ever change this to say, you know, five like that, it's still going to work the same way. Whereas if I had here hard coded the four, you see that it wouldn't change that. Or worse yet, let's say that like I, I actually have less items around. Then we're going to get that index out of range error, but we know that what that error is now, right? So again, one of the important things when you're coding is to make sure your code is flexible so that it can it can handle whatever you throw at it without it like choking. So you know that's that's one of the things you learn however very important with that you know you got to be careful not to over optimize things before you finish because when you're prototyping something and you're working on a project it's at least when you're a programmer it's very easy to get caught in like oh let me super optimize this and then you spend two hours optimize something only to find out that you never even needed it and so now you just wasted time so when working on a project you want to delete as much as possible that you don't need. You know, if, if it's a feature you want to add, think twice about adding it. And even if you do prototype it first, just get it running. Doesn't matter if it's nasty looking. Get going with the project. And only after you get it working and you see that everything is something you need, then you can worry about optimizing it. Okay. This sort of thing, sure, it's it's quick enough that it doesn't take a lot of time, you know, and, and then putting up then like hard coding it. So this optimization you can do on the fly. But if it's something that takes you more than five seconds to do, I would I would just I would say don't optimize it yet. Okay? So yeah, I can talk more about that kind of thing in the future. But anyways, so now that we know that that's how we can access uh, things in the for loop, we can go ahead and use the same approach to mod to, to to modify things in our in our multi-dimensional array by saying, you know, for i in range. Uh, and then we can say the length of the one. So that's gonna access the first dimension. So it's gonna go one per each, but now we wanna access the inner ones. So you can say for J in range, length of D one square bracket I, 
In this case, we want to make sure that we can check the length of these because we have right now. It, right now, it's pretty standard. We we have uh, three on each layer, so we could hard code a three here. But by putting the length here, we just want to check the length because like if we have some weird situation like this where it's no longer nicely square, it's like jacked, then uh, things would crash. But by putting the length there, we're sort of protecting ourselves. So protection is it's good, right? So, okay, so that's gonna basically put us in here. Because there's nothing right now in there, we don't need to go another layer, but I am going to put a little for loop to just insert a bunch of data in there. So I'm gonna just say 4K in range zero to three. So it runs three times. All right, well, why am I doing that? Why don't I just do that? Uh, let's just throw some data in there. So let's just put the number zero to three in there. So we'll say, uh, D1 I, D1 K, J, and then finally K gets K. So it's just gonna throw in numbers there, zero, one, two, okay? So if I do that, uh, you're not really gonna see much happen. Um, what well, index errors? Mm. C, I, J, oh, ooh, no, you don't need that level there. Sorry, my bad. Uh, we want to append. So, because we haven't declared the, we could declare them by put, throwing a bunch of numbers, but no, just, it's easier to do this. Okay, so now, I mean, you can't really see much. Oh, no, here, we do print it at the end. Nice. So, let's, uh, let's start out by trying to see it with the easiest way possible. So, for now, I'm just going to write an exit here so it terminates. If you ever want your Python code to close, like you can do that and what that does is basically you know stops printing everything else so if i run this again you'll see that uh you know there's nothing printed because it just stops the code so this is really useful when you're debugging if you just want to terminate your program temporarily like there it's not a good way to terminate a program but you know it's a good way to just kind of disable code uh for you know testing purposes so anyways There we go. <laughs> Let's try to just print out, flat out the array and see what it looks like. So not very cool, not very clean, but okay, that's printing like that. What if I put this in a little for loop for i in d1, print out i, let's see what that looks like. Yeah, that looks better. You know, it's still not as clean as I would like, not as realistic. So I could put that in the second for loop. So I can say for j in i, and then print out J. Let's see what that looks like now. Uh, oops, forgot the colon. For I in D1, for J in, oh, tabbing now. Okay, I mean, it looks nicer, but the problem with this method is that it's all sort of squish. So this, this would be the equivalent of like, If I take this right here, and let me just scroll down to the bottom. Right now, how it's being printed is kind of like this, which is okay, but I would like to see better, more separation. Like I would like to kind of space it out a little bit like that. So I can do that by just adding a line feed. And now it's more spaced out. So now we can see the different layers of that, okay? Because it's a 3D cube. And I think that's good enough. Uh, however, if I don't want to see the square brackets, you know, then, then then I do need to go one more layer deep in here uh, and say something like 4K and J. If I just say print K here, it's going to add a bunch of line feeds and I'm going to have a massive headache of line feeds. It's just going to be crazy. As you can see, I mean, it looks okay, but we it, we kind of have the same situation, but in the other dimension. So we do what I told you with the separator thing. So or end where we don't put anything in there. In fact, actually, maybe we put a comma and a space. Or actually, no comma, no comma, just a space. And now 
it's kind of back to what it was before, but now it's kind of squished this way. So we do need to add a line feed between these. So we can add a line feed here. And I think this one's going to be the good one. So uh, it added two line feeds. Hmm. It's adding a line feed on the line feed. So here, let's just do end equals. Or here, I know, I know. Well, there's two ways we could do this. We could say end equals and then just put nothing there. Or we could just make printed nothing like that. Either or. But I like the other one better. It's a little bit more descriptive as to what the heck we're trying to do here. So there we go. Okay. So that is kind of nice. That's kind of what we wanted. But as you can see, no more square brackets. So, of course, you might be like, ah, oh, screw it. I just, I don't care about the square brackets. I just want the easy mode. Like, this one was good enough. That's fine. That's okay. It's, you know, I'm just trying to say when you're trying to format data at the end of a report or something, you know, this will give you the most power to do it if you access the, the actual members. Plus, if you're actually trying to use the data to do math, you would do that right here. So, I think that's what we'll pick up next time. We're going to take this data and maybe like try to do the average or something. And this is where we're going to do that, like right here. Okay. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is pretty, uh, it, get, it gets pretty, you know, the, the, the curve gets pretty hard right now with, when you're trying to kind of understand these multidimensional data, but that's very important with data analytics to sort of be able to think of data in multidimensions. So don't feel bad if this is a little bit, uh, you know, like, like a lot. We'll definitely continue on this path and you know review more and uh, do more practice and keep going and then you'll do some assignments on this and you'll become a lot stronger with this stuff. And uh, we didn't get to, but next time we'll talk about break and continue. They're not really important, so they're kind of like on my low priority list of things to just throw in. Uh, more important is this 2D, 3D, and nested for loops. So all in all, I think that this was pretty good examples and that uh, you didn't really learn anything new today in terms of like syntax I mean, you're still using the same syntax as before but what you're really getting now is the good stuff which is practice using for loops and practice taking a data and actually converting it into something you can work with uh, and visualizing data and formatting data a little bit so this is this is the good stuff and this is the stuff you only really get once you practice it so just you know Play around with this if, uh, if you'd like. Try to make the data be printed backwards. Or try to make it print uh, the cubes horizontally, like all, you know, a bunch of cubes horizontally instead of vertically like we did of data. So like blocks this way. That's pretty tricky actually to do. Like it's not trivial. So uh, that will take you some effort, but uh, it would be pretty cool to see. So yeah, there's a lot of things you can do. Uh, Programming is power. Programming is that your imagination is your limit to what you can achieve. So, having said that, I will call it a day on that note, and wish you all to have a wonderful weekend. And I'll catch you around next time. Take care, and thanks for watching.